So today again for the first half an hour or so I'll talk about Lie groups, Lie groups in general and then come down to talking about compact groups the rest of the time. And last time I said I will state the so called fundamental theorem of Lie theory. I hope that is big enough this time. Last time I just told my writing was too small. The theorem says the following let G be a Lie group and H. G its linear algebra and H in G Li subalgebra. Let H in G be the subgroup generated by exponential of H. Recall that I will define the map exponential from the real algebra G to the group G. I look at the restriction of exponential the exponential map exp to H, take its image and take the group generated. Call that H. Maybe I will call it, uh, yeah, okay. <coughs> Let H be the group. Then there is a structure of a connected. Lie group H with an underline on H such that the inclusion of H in G is an analytic group sorry makes H bar the mapping H to G H, H bar to G <coughs> is a is a Lie subgroup of G. Recall that Lie subgroup is a Lie group together with a injective analytic homomorphism into G which makes that into analytic submanifold, analytic group homomorphism. So this is the fundamental theorem. You saw that if you have a subgroup, if you have a Lie subgroup you get a subalgebra of, of the Lie algebra. We are going the other direction. What I am saying now is that given a Lie subalgebra there is a Lie subgroup such that the Lie subalgebra is the one corresponding to the Lie subgroup. And what is the Lie subgroup? I, the underlying group I can describe as simply the group generated by image under the exponential map of the Lie algebra H. <coughs> so this is the fundamental theorem of Lie theory which tells you that you can go from Lie algebra to backward to Lie group. The earlier we associated any Lie, sub Lie subgroup Lie algebra, but now we can go back the other direction as well. <coughs> and supplementing this is the following theorem, it is a purely Lie algebra theorem which I will mention, it's known as Ados theorem, which says, uh, <coughs> I used to think Ado is a Japanese, he is not, he is actually a Russian, <coughs> Ado, <laughs> the name 
don't know, somehow made me think he was Japanese and uh, always thought it was so. Uh, turns out he's actually Russian. At least belonged to the Soviet Union in <laughs> the old days. <coughs> okay, the theorem says that if G is any finite dimensional the algebra, then there is an injective Lie algebra homomorphism from I from I from G into some matrix Lie algebra. For some n. Hmm? Yeah, n cross n matrices. They become a Lie algebra under the bracket operation. X y in M n R go into x into y minus y into x. That makes it into Lie algebra. What I am saying is that so G becomes a subalgebra of M n R. Sorry? Here. Subgroup generate by exponential h. Then there is a structure of a connected Lie group h bar on h. So h, is, h is only a group such that the inclusion of h in G makes this mapping into a group. Uh, this becomes a Lie subgroup. H bar and the inclusion of H bar in G. H bar is identified with H. Okay, comma, yeah, there is a comma there. That is a Lie subgroup. And Lie subgroup, after all, is a Lie group. And I will take sub manifold as well. So I have to have this. So the other theorem tells you that any Lie algebra can be realized in Lie algebra MNR. But this, as you know, MNR. Lie algebra of GLNR, a Lie group. And therefore, by the fundamental theorem, there is a Lie subgroup of GLNR corresponding to G. So, <coughs> so once this theorem is true, you can immediately get as a chronology for any Lie algebra. G, there exists a connected Lie group <coughs> with G as its Lie algebra. I do not have to say that. I am saying for me, it, Lie subgroup, there is a connected Lie subgroup. Yeah, if you like. What do I mean by matrix Lie group? I love to say matrix Lie group is nothing but a Lie subgroup of MNR. Okay. So, of course, for any Lie algebra G, there exists a connected Lie group with G as its Lie algebra. In fact, one can replace this connected by connected, simply connected as well. Because if you have a Lie group, connected Lie group, its universal covering is automatically a Lie group and has the same Lie algebra. Because of that you have a, once you say simply connected, it is even unique up to isomorphism. The simply connected group is unique up to Is the structure on H coming from that of G? See, H is a group. On that, I want to say there is a Lie group structure. So I want to give it a different name. If, uh, that's a, when you say Lie subgroup, if, you can think of the actual subgroup of G or 
of the analytic manifold which doesn't get the induced topology, which doesn't necessarily get the induced topology. To make a distinction between the two, I keep writing H lower bar and H, that's it. In fact, in future, I will not make a distinction. I will, I will allow some confusion, <laughs> like the least subgroup and the, which is actually a pair, will be simply denoted H without the inclusion being mentioned. It's in the context, it will be clear what inclusion one is talking about. Sorry? Since H bar eventually is a Lee subgroup of G. Yeah, Lee subgroup means what? It is a Lee group together with an injective analytic group homomorphism. Oh. But, the, but the induced topology may not be the manifold topology on H bar. Because, uh, the topology is inducing from G, right? Sorry? The topology then coming from G, right? No. That's, so there, is a, there is some topology which makes it into an analytic manifold. Uh -huh. And an inclusion into that, the top. I already told you that a Lee subgroup may not get the topology from the ambient Lee group. The winding line on the torus, E per I theta, E per I alpha theta, where alpha is irrational, will give you an example. So <coughs> that one has to make a, this kind of fuss, otherwise there can be confusion, but in future I am not going to make that fuss. I will simply write H both for this pair, where did I write it down? Yeah. I will write H both for the square and the group H itself. I'll, of course, if there is a possibility of the topology being different, I will mention it in the context. Okay, that is what uh, <coughs> that is a theorem which I did not state last, last time, but I mentioned it as the fundamental theorem of the theory. Now, <coughs> Let me, with that, I still have a few, uh, to make a few more comments about uh, what I said last time about the exponential map and so on. The first comment is that, why the name exponential map? When G is MNR and G is GLNR, for X in G, X pex is actually equal to sigma or GLN X power R and R factorial. X is a matrix, I raise it to the power R and sum up like this, which is the reason for giving it the name exponential in the, for a general Lie group G. So if you have a subalgebra, for instance, the exponential map will simply be the restriction of the exponential map. So if also recall, I do not know if I stated it last time, but if I did not, I need to state it. It says the following. If G is a Lie group and I H to G, a Lee subgroup, with Lie algebra, H contained in the subalgebra of G, which is Lie algebra of G, <coughs> then I uh, yeah, I of exponential x equals exponential of d of i at 1 di. This is the differential at the point at the identity of the map i. So, d i of 1 the Lie algebra has been identified as the tangent space at the identity. So here is an x which is in h, di1 of x then gets into g. Whether you take the exponential first in h or later in g, you get the same result. So 
this diagram is commutative. This is exponential to be very specific, this is the exponential of the group G, here is the exponential of the, the subgroup H, the group H, we put a subscript X and here is the homomorphism. This diagram is computed, <coughs> which is which also tells you why in the fundamental theorem I said H is going to be the group generated by exponential of H, <coughs> German H. Okay, so this is the uh, one comment I wanted to make. Yeah, and I think I prob probably made this comment earlier, but let me Exponential G Lee group, then there is a, an open neighborhood omega of 0 in G such that X of omega, which I call U, is open in G. And U is open in G and the map, the inverse of X which will go from U to omega is analytic. So there is a neighborhood of the identity in G which is this isomorphic to a neighborhood of uh, 0 in G analytically. <coughs> what is the rotation I1? One? one is the identity element. Oh, I, 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 one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Also the fundamental theorem. Sorry? The fundamental theorem. Yeah. What can we say? So does it require finite dimensionality or it can be infinite dimensional also? I am sorry. The dimensionality. So is it finite dimensional or always finite dimensional? Always finite? So no. Finite Everything is finite dimensional. Yeah, yeah, we, we are working entirely with finite dimensional so things. Can you say something in the infinite topic? Is it false in infinite dimension? No. People who study Lie groups in this context will say that they find Yeah, the <laughs> infinite dimensional groups are quite uh, d difficult to handle. They are not. Uh, Anyway, uh, okay, so this is analytic, which this implies u comma x pin bus from u to g is a coordinate chart this of course is a consequence of the inverse function theorem. The tangent space to the Lie algebra at 0 can be identified with the Lie algebra. The tangent space to the group also is identified with the Lie algebra and the exponential map you calculate the differential is simply the identity map of the Lie algebra onto itself which therefore by the inverse function theorem you find that this is going to be analytic and therefore in particular this is going to be a chart. This is can be identified with some RM inside and find some RM. <coughs> okay, that is uh, one fact which I will freely use in future. I will, I, <coughs> the more sophisticated the theorem, I will try to not use it, the fundamental theorem of Lie theory, I will need it sometime, but by and large I will avoid it because I have not given a proof of that, but not have I given a proof, but these are things which can, from what I have said, you, you can recover the proof fairly easily. <coughs> okay, yeah. And another another thing which we uh, proved earlier is that 
if x y are in G with bracket x y equal 0, then x t x and x t y s y commute for every t s now. This came out to the fact that the one parameter groups of the vector fields commute. So, this is fact 1, fact 2 and this is a converse it says the following there exists a neighborhood u of 1 such that in G such that let, let me put it. Let omega and u be as above. Replacing <coughs> omega by a smaller set if necessary, smaller open set, open neighborhood of identity. Number of 0 in G, we have x x x y commute for x y in omega if and only if x and y commute. One way we it's already said if x and y commute then x x and x y commute but the other way is also true. The reason is that you can think of this uh, multiplication as uh, mapping of uh, this open set to omega cross omega into a slightly bigger open set. Think of that and then if you cut down the neighborhood sufficiently the it is an analytic function so the corresponding Taylor series will converge in the origin. And that the Taylor series of, for the multiplication will converge. <coughs> and from that it, you can also talk of the, the inverse, you can also assume that this omega is so small, u is so small that you can think of the, x itself as the identity map, I mean you can think of identify omega with u then x becomes simply the identity map, no more, nothing more. <coughs> so and then you can talk of the logarithm that is the inverse map which is logarithm and the power series for that the Taylor series of that can also be assumed to converge. Put all these things together, you find, and then it is easy to check that if you call, call that logarithm ln, ln x, ln x x into ln x y, you can check is ln x, is uh, ln x x into ln x y equals uh, <coughs> ln of x plus y, ln x plus ln, ln x x plus ln x y, x y. So, for some things sufficiently close to the to the identity, you can take the corresponding logarithms and they will converge if and only the original x and y converge. It is a matter of writing down convergence of Taylor series, that is all is to it. Okay, that is another thing I have to state, yeah, real vector spaces in general. So, when you, when you want this to be compact, when is Rn modulo a subgroup, discrete subgroup compact, discrete subgroup is necessarily of this form. It will be compact if and only if R is equal to the dimension of the vector space. So that really becomes G is isomorphic to Rn by Zn Rr, R, which is same thing as circle group S1 power R, which is what I called a torus. I think I gave the name torus to such groups. So, torus denoted also TR, a torus of dimension R. So, the simplest compact Lie groups in some sense, compact connected Lie groups are simply the tori. 
they are the compact connected separate groups. This is where I start on compact groups. <coughs> okay, now when you want to study compactly groups, one of the key things, one of the keys to studying the structure are subgroups which are abelian and comp compact abelian subgroups, compact connected abelian subgroups. So we look for tori inside a compact group. So, and what we, what I'll prove is that some results about how you can arrive at tori inside a compactly group. <coughs> if G is a compactly group, first before that I have to G compactly group. Then G admits. A faithful representation in some GLNR or GLNC. Any compactly group can be realized as a subgroup of a linear group of GLN. This is not true of a general linear group. For instance, if you take the group SL2R, it's universal covering. SL2R is a Lie group, of course. It's a, it's a linear Lie group, it's contained in GL2R, but its universal covering is not linear. It cannot put it inside a linear group, the universal covering of SL2R. The fundamental group of SL2R is Z, and the universal covering does not embed in any GLN whatever. So in general, the Lie group, may not have, the algebra always has a faithful linear representation, but the Lie group may not have a faithful representation, a linear representation. <coughs> However, a compact group does. How does one prove that? A compact group, you know, it acts on L2 of G. Say L2 G uh, will, will confine some real valid functions if you want to embed in GLNR. Take L2 G with real valid functions. Then we know L2G decomposes into a direct sum, orthogonal direct sum of finite dimensional spaces. Now, the G, the point is that, <coughs> let me, maybe I should. I want to say is this. So, this is theorem. Peter Weil tells us there exists representations rho i. Irreducible finite dimensional exists. Irreducible finite dimensional representations such that <coughs> G such that for every G in G there exists I such that rho i of g <coughs> is not equal to 1. In L2 g, g acts faithfully. That is, no element of g will go into the identity element unless it is the identity element itself in L2 of g. Therefore, the same thing holds in the orthogonal direct sum, which means if you go, there are, count, there are countably many, and you, if you go far enough, any given g, you can avoid the identity. Okay. <coughs> rho g will be different from rho of the identity. That's what rho I being faithful. This, well, okay, to show that finitely many of the rho I suffice.
So what do I do? I you fix a neighborhood, suppose u is the neighborhood of 1 in g, open neighborhood. Then if you look at g minus u, this is compact. And look for every x in g minus u, no, for, sorry, for, a, for a given i, let w i be the set of points. Let me write um, omega i with a set of x and g rho i x not equal to 1. This is an open set. Okay. And so a finite number of this omega i will cover you because we know that any x and g there is some i such that rho i x is not equal to u. So this is a covering of g and therefore a covering of g minus u g minus u is compact and therefore there is already a finite cover will do the job. So this says hence there exists i1, i2, in such that the direct sum, if you look at the direct sum rho i1 plus rho i2, this direct sum which I call say sigma. then kernel sigma is completely contained in u. So that kernel sigma is contained in u. So you find if I, if I can show that there is in any Lie group there is a neighborhood U which does not contain any non-trivial subgroup, I am done. See if you what the, what see the omega is cover the whole of G and therefore in particular they cover G minus U which is a compact set. So if I look at say pick I1, I2, I, I n such that this omega I n these are chosen such that omega i1 union omega i2 etc. union omega i n equals g minus u. <coughs> Choose this like this and then then you find if you call the sigma the point every point of g minus u is outside the <coughs> kernel of rho i for every i. So you find that kernel sigma has to be contained in u. So if I can show Kernel sigma is a group after all. Okay. <coughs> it's a it's a compact group. So all that I have to show is that no the, there is a no open neighborhood the identity u such that it contains no compact subgroup whatever, no non-trivial compact subgroup. So suffices to show that there exists neighborhood u of uh, 1 in G which contains no non-trivial compact subgroup. So it's of a, in fact we one can show that there is no non-trivial compact abelian subgroup because you can take one element in the non one non-trivial element of the group and take the group generated that and take its closure that will be abelian. So this is true if uh, suffices to show that or, even, or simply that U contains no non-trivial compact subgroup.
So abelian, sorry. Abelian subgroup. Well, see, if you look at the exponent, take a neighborhood in which the exponential map is 1 to 1. So if you have an element x such that x bar r is 0, exponential x, so x in u, so x bar r equal to 1, so x itself is exponential of x for some x, then you find exponential rx is all the time in u and exp x power r equal to 1, no, uh, sorry, x power r in u. So you find exponential rx is all the time in u. So it is an abelian, and therefore if you, if you take its closure, that will be a compact group which is completely contained in u. Well, uh, it is, uh, so the point is, and therefore it will, if it is, uh, either this group is finite or it will have a connected component which means there is a torus. But once you have a torus, inside the torus there are elements of finite order. So there is always a very finite group, non-trivial finite group. So a torus after all is a product of circles and a circle has a finite group. So you can take the product of finite groups. So you find finite abelian groups sitting inside the neighborhood U. You have to contradict that. And a finite cyclic abelian groups in fact. I, I will leave it to you as an exercise. It's, uh, you have to fiddle with the exponential map a little bit. It is not entirely trivial but not uh, complicated, very complicated either. So, so this is if and only if u contains no non-trivial finite subgroup, abelian, so in fact no non-trivial cyclic group. It is expressed by saying that uh, G has no small subgroups. That is, there is a certain neighborhood identity which contains no subgroup, whatever. So, this is phrased as saying G contains no small subgroups. So, from now on, I will assume any compact group, any compact Lie group has a faithful finite dimensional representation that is a subgroup of GL or V for some vector space V. And once you assume that, that then of course uh, we have seen that any compact group in any representation leaves an inner product on the vector space invariant. Okay. So we will also assume that therefore it leaves an inner product on the vector space invariant which means it actually goes into the orthogonal group. Orthogonal group is the group which preserves the inner product. So any compact group, so this is the first theorem if you like. <coughs> any compact the group G admits or oh, I think I said this every <coughs> continuous form of them of a Lie group into another Lie group is necessarily analytic. Did I say this or not? It is a consequence of the Cartan theorem. I, I, maybe I will say it. Okay. Any compact Lie group G admits an analytic homomorphism the orthogonal group O n for some integer n. Admits an injective observe. <coughs> so here I must remark here it is a consequence of theorem of Cartan's theorem stated last time. Says the following if G H are Lie groups 
and f g to h is a continuous homomorphism. Then f is analytic. Any continuous homomorphism is necessarily analytic group homomorphism. Why is this? The idea is this you look at g cross h that is a Lie group in its own right and then in this you get the look at the subset the graph of f. So g f g look at the set g f g g in g is obviously subset of g cross h. It is a close subgroup, it is obviously group because f is a group homomorphism. What you get there is a group and this group is actually closed obviously in g cross h it is a graph of a continuous map so it is closed. And therefore by Cartan's theorem it is a Lie group. So this graph is a Lie group now so let us call this G, G is the Lie group and sitting in G cross H. Now look at the <coughs> and the map G to H is nothing but you have a you have projection from G to G. The mapping from G to H is uh, and this, uh, <coughs> this projection is 1 to 1, it is a graph so it's, this projection is 1 to 1 on 2 and so I can invert it. So if I invert it and take the inclusion <coughs> and then project to the other factor that is how I get H. Okay. <coughs> now G is sitting inside G cross H. <coughs> now I, um, I want to say that uh, So I have G sitting inside G cross H, it is a, it's a closed subgroup so I can look at its Lie algebra which I will call G prime. It is a subalgebra of the Lie algebra of G cross H, it is subalgebra of that. Now look at this projection G prime to G. <coughs> now the first thing I want to say is that this G prime is subalgebra and <coughs> yeah G is a Lie subgroup corresponding to that okay. At, 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 at the moment this mapping is only continuous but it is uh, <coughs> a Lie subgroup and therefore it follows this mapping is analytic and this projection is you see mapping G to G cross H and then the projection G therefore it is analytic. So this mapping is analytic and so you get a mapping from G prime to G. <coughs> okay. This is exponential anyway you have you get a mapping from G prime to G. Now observe that G to G is the mapping is uh, <coughs> continuous it is analytic and look at the differential of the of the G prime. If the differential is not an isomorphism, if the differential is not surjective, then what happens is that it is of constant rank. So the image will be uh, uh, locally, if you take a small uh, open set, uh, open able to the identity, open able to any point, it will map into some subset which is a submanifold in, inside G. Okay. And <coughs> express G as uh, Countable union of uh, compact sets by translating some open neighbor to the close neighbor to the entity down there. And if you do that, take the image that will cover all of G because G to G is subjective. Once it and therefore I, I, each image is a compact set. So I have a countable union of compact sets covers the whole of G. 
by the bad category theorem, at least one of them must, must contain an open set. But they are all translates of the same thing, so every one of them contains an open set. From that it is easy to see that this mapping is a, <coughs> this mapping has to be, okay. on the other hand, if the, if, the, if, the, if the mapping from G prime to G is not subjective, the image here will go into a nowhere dense subset. And the union cannot be the whole of G because of the bare category theorem. I want to use the bare category. Maybe I'm not saying it too well. The point is that, let me put it like this: If G prime to G is not onto image of neighborhood of one in G prime is a nowhere dense. It's a, sub, it's a sub manifold as a matter of fact, <coughs> it's, a, it's a nowhere dense closed, so image of compact neighborhood, it's a nowhere dense compact set. And now write G, this neighborhood let me give, compact neighborhood let me give it a name V then G is after all union V G N for some countable subset of the group G. <coughs> then you find that the image pi G of V G N is compact nowhere dense. Nowhere dense means there is no interior. This implies union pi G V G N which is the whole of G has a void interior, a contradiction because it is all of G. This is the bare so called bare category theory. So if the mapping is not of maximal rank it cannot be, <coughs> if the, the maxim, mapping has to be maximal rank which means this mapping is, the differential is subjective which automatically means it is injective as well. And therefore the differential is an isomorphism, therefore it is an analytic isomorphism. All of this implies that pi g is an analytic isomorphism and what happens is this, so pi g inverse from g to g is analytic and the original map f is nothing but take pi g inverse in the inclusion, apply pi is same as pi g inverse composed with the inclusion of g in g cross h. And compose with compose this with uh, <coughs> the other projection pi g, pi h. This is f. Each one of these is analytic, therefore f is analytic. The crucial fact is Cartan's theorem, namely the subgroup which you get is an analytics is a Lie subgroup of G cross H. So basically the fact that uh, the graph is an analytic manifold enables you to prove that the map which you get is analytic. So <coughs> by the way a good reference uh, for Lie groups is uh, the Tata Institute lecture notes, Brewer, Tata Tata Institute lecture notes. There are two of them, one on periodic Lie groups, one on Lie groups. I think it is called Lie groups and or representation theory, some such thing is the title. It is uh, Tata Institute lecture notes. I do not remember the precise title. 
Lie groups and representation theory or some such thing because it has in fact uh, it is a good book from another point of view. There are theorems about representation theory which you do not find in any other book. For example, uh, the fact so, so called Mauchner's theorem which tells you that any representation, unitary representation of a Lie group can of a locally compact group can be decomposed into irredu irreducible unitary representation as a direct integral. That is the that kind of theorem is uh, difficult to find a proof in the literature. <coughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a bijective. The point is, I want to say it's an, the mapping is analytic. I, I want to invert it as an analytic map. It's a bijective. The inverse exists as a continuous map. That is not a problem. I want to say it exists as an analytic map. And for that, you will have to prove that it's analytic inverse exists, which means you have to prove that d pi, the differential, is an isomorphism. Right. So the inclusion is analytic and the projection is also analytic. In, 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 inclusion is analytic, yes, but G, what has G to do with capital G? I mean, the script G, what has it to do with the other G? It is an analytic, I have to know it is as analytic manifold is the same as G. That is what I am proving. I am not saying it very well, perhaps, but you know, the fact is that this mapping is con continuous, yeah. it is even, it's even analytic, yeah. but I have to know that the inverse is analytic. Only then I can comp compose and say f is analytic. To say f is analytic, I want this. But any bijective analytic homomorphism, it's bijective analytic and homomorphism as well. Yeah, why is it? So what? Okay. Uh, the, the, the proof that it is in invertible okay. is to say okay. that the differential map at all points is an isomorphism. Okay. Right. If it is not an isomorphism, first it is enough to prove it is subjective because the dimensions are going to be okay. <coughs> so, you have to prove uh, subjective which is what I did for which the bare category theorem has to be used. By the way, that is that's how I used the bare category theorem. If the mapping is differential map is not subjective, if the differential map is not a, an isomorphism, then the image is a image of a small neighborhood is going to be an analytic submanifold, a pro proper analytic submanifold, which is therefore interior is empty and I take a compact thing so the image will be compact and the rest of the argument goes through. Okay, now that is the, well I think, uh, uh, I, I do not know if the thing has been in the first version of the notes, uh, this uh, bare category argument is not given and it is kind of uh, spread. Uh, uh, the in fact, a reviewer pointed out that there was an error there. I mean, the bare category theorem was not the in Brewer's notes. The uh, they slipped up and didn't, didn't quite complete the argument. But uh, some some reviewer pointed it out, and maybe it has been corrected since. I don't know. <coughs> anyway. As I said, uh, that is a uh, good introduction to Lie groups. I guess they are pretty fast without any fuss. Okay, what is the next thing I want to say? At this point, I am going to talk some, some, say something about the topology of uh, compact Lie groups, which is, will be used in proving further theorems about the structure. One, what would one would like to get hold of is tori inside G and the one of the uh, basic facts is if you have a connected D group then and take a maximal torus subgroup there, maximal torus inside there, then every element of the group is a conjugate in that torus. Every element in G can be conjugated into that torus. That is that's the theorem which I will be proving and that will tell you that to know the character of a representation which is trace of rho G is enough to know the trace rho g on the torus because everything is conjugate to the torus. So, and then all theorems about representations can be transformed into theorems about these characters on the torus. So, and since we understand uh, characters on the torus rather well, it is 
you can try to get hold of all representations of the group itself using the torus. That is the strategy. But for that, first you have to say that there exists tori inside, good tori, and that every element is a conjugate in the maximal torus. <coughs> in the maximal torus. Now all, in fact, all maximal tori are conjugates. That is also true. Okay. So, towards that end, there is a some topology of the group gets involved. So, G is a connected compact Lie group. This implies G is a no orientable compact manifold. Orientable means for a an analytic manifold is orientable if there exists if there is there is an assignment oriental manifold m of dimension m of an element omega m in exterior m of T m m tangent space m at m. This is an m dimensional vector space and the m th exterior power is a one dimensional thing. So, I want an omega m which is non-zero such that in any chart u f u to r m look at <coughs> the image under d f of omega m this will be of the form sigma u i sorry this will be the form u m D x1 d x m <coughs> with u analytic that is the definition of a manifold being orientable. So, sorry, see under look at the image f u to r m that induces a map d f m from the tangent space at m to the tangent space at f m to r m. Okay. This tangent space oh, I, should, I should say maybe I have shifted to differentials. Oh, let me write it like this. So, okay, omega m is an element of uh, actually m t m. So, d f of omega m um, This is the d by dx1, d by dxm are tangent vectors to Rm at every point m give, give you tangent vector, and this exterior product of this d by dx1 etcetera d by dxm <coughs> is therefore the element in the exterior nth power. So you dfm is a mapping of this, and therefore you get exterior m dfm, which goes from exterior m tm to exterior m. P, oh, this notation is bad. Uh, I should call it point P. If there is an assignment for every P, 
in a of an element like this such that any coordinate chart df of omega m omega m is limited to the exterior mth power so it go into d by dx etc d by dx m times u m and you want u to be analytic and it is non zero means u m is non zero for u p is non zero at p and this at fp so get uh, mapping from df p from exterior m tp to exterior m tfp <coughs> well i'm assuming that you will be familiar with the notion of exterior powers and exterior algebra <coughs> so you want locally any omega can be it's an element in the m exterior power the m exterior power of the vector space rm which can be identified the tangent space at every point is of dimension 1 and the, it's the generated by this element it's this is a basic element so you find df omega m must necessarily the form some scalar times this the scalar of course depends on p and we want this dependence to be analytic then you call it a, if if there is such a form omega so such a form omega is uh, usually called a volume form and if there exists such a thing then you call the <coughs> manifold orientable okay rn of course is orientable because you have this d by dx1 x etc d by dx m and for example the sphere is orientable two sphere but the projective two space which you get from the sphere by identifying antipodal points is not orientable it's an analytic manifold but it's not orient and one can produce from that many more examples of uh, in fact in general you can talk of the n dimensional real projective space which is orientable if n is odd is not orientable if n is even that kind of thing. a lie group there's no problem is orientable because at every point you have this uh, fix some basis of the time of the of, of the lie algebra at the identity and translate that basis everywhere then if you take the then the exterior power of this basic element c1 it's try here translate them all over then you get an analytic differential form which is everywhere non zero so yeah. there is no summation there right huh? what is the summation there is no summation there actually oh no summation sorry you are right no summation and, uh, you want u of p to be non zero that automatic one i'm assuming the omega p is not zero i'm assuming that there is a for every p there is omega p which is not zero in such a way that when you write d of omega p it becomes like this with up analytic since d of omega p is non zero up has to be non zero so this is the notion of orientability and a fundamental theorem in topology says the following if m is an orientable manifold then hn of dimension yam hm of yam z yam thermal z is zero if yam is not uh, sorry yam connected then then the yam thermal z with coefficient z zero if yam is not compact so as of z if m is compact this is a basic result about topological manifolds orientable manifold take the top dimension of the dimension m m is the hm z if the manifold is compact it is zero if the manifold is not compact and the immediate consequence suppose 
m and n are compact manifolds of the same dimension. Then f m to n a continuous map then look at the mapping h n m h n n h m is the dimension both are compact so both are z so you identified it with z also here with z the identification with z of course is not unique you can change it to by plus minus 1 but anyhow so one calls if you fix this identification with z then this map is simply given by an integer because both are z any homomorphism between z and z is multiplication by an integer which is called the degree of the map so a continuous map then h n m and is multiplication by an integer d once you fix one fixes isomorphisms as indicated and the d is called the degree of the map Then what happens is this, one has a nice criterion for when the mapping m to n is subjective, is a sufficient condition. It is on to if d of Not zero. <coughs> if this happens, then subjective. Why? Once you grant that theorem, it's immediate because if it's not subjective, it will factor through h n n minus a point. It's not on to, so some points are avoided. So the mapping factors through n minus a point. But the homology of n minus point is zero. So h n m z to h n n z, the mapping becomes zero. So the degree written zero. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah. See, is on to if not the p in n minus f m, such a point exists. Then f m to n factors through. n minus p oh so this sorry the mapping should be in the other direction homology okay so factor through so you have h n n f m to n is a map then the mapping from will go from in its cohomology i am writing so it goes from n to m anyway so h n n so f m to factor through that is you have m n minus p and then you have f here this the same f actually goes through this, this is the inclusion and the mapping in homology cohomology will therefore factor through h n of n minus p which is 0 so the mapping is if the mapping is not subjective the degree is 0 so if the degree is positive or non zero then the mapping is on to how am i going to use this theorem now in the context of lie groups the point is this theorem 
the map let r be any integer not equal to 0 then the map x to x power r of g in g is on to how will I prove it? I will prove it by proving that the degree of this map x raised to x power r is not 0. If r is not 0, the degree is not 0. That is how I will prove this <coughs> result. And this of course means that I have to know something about more about the cohomology of, of a compactly group. And there is a beautiful theorem of Hopf which tells you that the cohomology algebra of uh, the group and all this can be done instead of the z you can work with q or r makes no difference. So here coefficients I have here not mentioned coefficients I take coefficients with r. Sorry? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, here, right, right. Z should be once I replace Z by R, one place. Now, it's a beautiful theorem of Hopf which tells you the following. See, G is a group, so you have the group multiplication <coughs> in G. So G cross. G to G, you have the group multiplication. This induces a mapping from the cohomology G cross G, which is thanks. Homology with coefficients in R all the time. So we have mapping M star from H star G to H star G tensor H star G. This is a so-called Kurnath relation which tells you H star of G cross G is this. H star G cross G cross G. Oh, what? Thank you. Coefficients in R all the time. Now so, and this is the H star G, the cohomology has an algebra structure. It is a so called co graded anti commutative algebra. H star G is a sum of HPG, P equal to 0 to infinity, and it is a finite dimensional situation, so it will be 0 beyond a certain stage. So, in fact, it is equal to 0 to q, q is bad for me, let me write n, n is dimension of uh, g. The cohomology of h star g is this and of h star g tensor g, g cross g sigma yeah let me let me write here r equals 0 10 uh, <coughs> r equals 0 10 sigma p plus q equal to r h p g the cohomology of h star g cross g is this and what happens is when you apply m star which will map h p g any any h r g into sigma p plus q equal to r h p g 
And this mapping of H <coughs> star G to H star G tensor G H star G tensor H star G is a algebra homomorphism. Cohomology is a functor with category in the in the, from the category of topological space in the category of rings. And so this mapping M star to this is a induced mapping in cohomology is a ring homomorphism and this has been identified with this ring. As rings this is an isomorphism. So you have this you have a algebra a ring it is an algebra over R and then you have a mapping of the ring. So let me <coughs> you also have something more here before I go on. It is this M star of an element X in HPG turns out to be equal to X tensor 1. This is an element of H naught plus 1 tensor X plus sigma AI tensor BI where AI is in H QI, HPI, BI is in H QI of G with both PI, QI <coughs> greater than 1. And this AI tensor BI is in P i plus q i has to be equal to p. Hmm? So, no, the point is strictly greater than 1. When uh, see when if it is uh, if one of them is 0 which is less than 1 which is which is less than sorry greater than yeah, right greater than equal to 1 is right yeah sorry. Here, yeah. The, these are the terms where PI or QI can be 0, the other terms are like this. So, in general, an algebra, a graded algebra, graded anti, and also, of course, the cup product has the property if x in HPG and y is in HQG, then x into y minus 1 power p q y into x. This is standard property of the cup product. <coughs> now, in particular this means, notice that this means if x is in h p, p odd implies x square is 0 because x into x is minus 1 power p square into x and therefore this is 0 and we are working over r. So, so twice x into x is 0 all odd degree elements have square 0 and even degree elements commute with every other element that is the kind of thing that happens. So, <coughs> what Hopf did is that this extra structure on G tells us let me put it like this theorem due to Hopf it says that H star G is isomorphic the exterior algebra of E where E is a graded vector space. This is also a gradation, it is anti commutative in the sense that x y x per x per sorry x into y equals y into x into minus 1 power p q 
where x and y are degree p and q and E is an exterior algebra where E is a graded vector space with only odd grades. <coughs> so, it is the exterior algebra over a vector space. Exterior algebra the in the exceed algebra you have elements e itself is a vector space what I want is that it has e equals sigma r e i where e i has grade r i odd and then when I take the exceed algebra the elements will be the form product of elements of the form e i 1 etc e i p each EI1 has a gradation Ri and I simply add up the corresponding gradation. That is the gradation of the element which you get by taking products. So, that is how you make H star G into a graded algebra and the theorem is that as a graded algebra H star G is isomorphic to this kind of this special kind of graded algebra. In fact, a graded algebra with uh, anti commutative graded algebra <coughs> with uh, map like A to A tensor A satisfying this condition. If you take the pth graded component you get x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x plus terms of this kind where pi plus qi add up to p and pi and q are both strictly greater than or equal to 1. <coughs> so, such a thing is nowadays called a Hopf algebra. Hopf actually you, I mean, pointed out that uh, the group H star, the ring H star G has this structure and since then it has been known as a Hopf algebra and it is a pure algebraic theorem therefore, if you have an algebra graded algebra with this property with a diagonal map, you have map M star, you have graded algebra H star G with a map M star like this plus this property and is finite dimensional, the entire algebra is finite dimensional then it is necessarily a exterior algebra over a finite dimensional vector space with only odd graded components. Okay, that is the theorem and we will use this theorem to prove the fact that x to x power r is onto for every r. I think I will have to stop at this point. I am afraid I have to, I am using some topology which is probably not very familiar stuff. But, uh, I, the alternative is to use some sophisticated differential geometry which also may be equally unfamiliar. So, it is and I have a, my, my personal tastes are in favor of uh, topology not different geometries. It is which good to see different things being brought to bear. Sir? It is good to see different well, things. Okay, no, but the more important thing is that the lecture should be intelligible. So, <laughs> that is what I am worried about. If I, if I uh, assume lots of things it becomes less and less uh, <coughs> intelligible. Okay. So, next time I will prove Hopf's theorem and give indications to the proof. It is a purely algebraic result. In fact, it will be one can try to prove it as an exercise, it is not uh, it is not difficult. You have to it is it is one does it by induction on the dimension of E. I mean the if you like yeah, how do I get hold of E? You take H star G and in that you have the ideal of all cohomology classes which are of degree greater than 0 call that ideal i. Look at i by i square, i by i square i has a gradation respect gradation i is i square also is graded. So, i by i square is again graded and you can take well, the basis of i by i square and which is in every di different graded components and take elements in i with the same grad, grad, grad component and then take the vector space generated by them. You have to argue by uh, induction on dimension of that. So, you pick out one element and take the ideal generated by that pass to the quotient, take the ideal element of least order pass, pass to the quotient by that, then you get a lower dimension. You, uh, you have set up the induction hypothesis, you can easily show that the map M star goes down to a map of etcetera, then so set up induction. It's Finally, we have proved it in the case of 
when that uh, dimension is 1, then the i by i square has dimension 1 which is easy, okay that, that is how it is proved in where they say something more about the proof next time and use that to prove this. And once I prove that I can immediately show that every element in the group is actually contained in a torus which is far from obvious. Notice if you if have a torus then it is so it's, it's obvious that the mapping x to x power r is subjective because it is true in the circle. From the circle x to x power r is a subjective map and the first true for product of circles. And but for a general compact Lie group the proof is not so straightforward, it is not so simple. And the point is since I said every element ultimately I want to prove that every element has a conjugate in a torus and therefore in the torus if every element you can extract the rth root, you can extract the rth root of any element because the element has a conjugate in the torus, you can take the rth root and go back by the same conjugation. So that if, so the, if the theorem is true, I mean, if the theorem that every element has a conjugate in a torus is true, it is this that every the rth power map, the subject to map is going to be true. So we are turning it around, we will prove first that the rth power map is a subject to map and from that we will deduce that there is every element is actually going to con be contained in a torus and then we will prove that all maximal tori are conjugates. This is the way it works out. Sorry I have overstepped my time, I do not know every time maybe I have got to be overstepping my time. <laughs>